I guess this is going to be another vlog type video. So at the moment, I like how the channel's going. The views have been climbing rapidly each month. I've been getting steady stream of new subscribers. It's good. Like there's kind of, I like the culture that's sort of developing around the channel. I've tried a lot more of everything. I've done vlogs. I've done more serious uh, edits. I've done comical ones. I was able to use uh, Boots's speech in a few different things and everyone needs to go see that. Um, you kind of need to see that to be able to understand this channel. It helps to know more. But yeah, that's a really good 101 if you're not familiar with Marxism in any way. It's not the only thing that you can watch, but I obviously recommend it. <laughs> Obsess over it and sleep um, in a pile of, yeah, copies of it. So that's been good. And at the moment, I feel like I was going to say I'm getting a bit bored with this type of video that I'm doing at the moment. And that's not true. I can see being entered. It's actually that I can see being entertained by doing the type of video that I'm doing now indefinitely. <laughs> and I feel if that's all I do, I'm going to miss the deeper kind of conversation that I want to try and have. And that kind of involves, um, I guess, yeah, bringing together some of the threads that I've been planting in videos so far. So I'm gonna, if anyone missed the like, I had a video that I did about, you know, Doug Stanhope and Bill Burr and all these like right wing uh, comedians that I respect as comedians, but I can cr criticize their politics, you know, the same way I can with Vinnie Paz and culture. You know how that works? <laughs> you can um, criticize something and still love it or appreciate it. Um, or see the value in it. But that was just a prelude to the fact that I wanted to talk about uh, Bill Burr and Joe Rogan. And I wish I could get clips because I can sort of vaguely remember them saying these things and I'm sure if I hunted around enough I could. But their whole thing is this like, is individualism because they clearly have been drenched in just this McCarthyite anti-communism and don't have the ability to even really think about those ideas. Yeah, they don't have the ability to think about those ideas. But they kind of still recognize in some respects that, you know, the average Joe has, you know, the system <laughs> on top of them and, or him, and the their suggestion is essentially like focus on yourself and i've heard bill burr say something to the effect of like yeah you know because he, he's often into conspiracy which is like pseudo nazism but he's like yeah the system is on top of you um and they're coming to get everybody i remember him saying something like that they're gonna they're gonna like scoop everybody up and eat them essentially and you just have to try and like escape the the eating process like jump out while they're everyone else is getting scooped up and 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 find your own freedom essentially through building wealth and that's always presented as you know obviously that's how you do it if you understand business like blah, blah, blah. but the concept of collective resistance is unimaginable to either of them they never really talk about those ideas in in any serious kind of way and I thought that was interesting because in Boots' speech, he brings up the fact that the West Coast dock workers in America, longshoremen or whatever you call them, are the highest paid blue collar workers in America, earning something like a hundred grand a year for unskilled labor. And the reason why they are the highest paid is because that union was the only union that didn't cave to McCarthyism and sell out their members. And so to this day, they're still the strongest, most militant union. And as a result, their workers are living this fantasy life, essentially. But it's not just one of them. The entire workforce did that through collective struggle. And that's the type of thing that just is invisible to someone who has no class consciousness.
So there are these ideas about rebuilding unions and rebuilding working class resistance that has an industrial base. And the idea is that we should be able to start now. And so I think that the most promising avenues for that type of thing are probably in different forms of experimental unionism in terms of like, how do I explain what I mean by that? Okay, so in Australia, I'm going to actually link a video which is made by a, um, an Australian socialist. He's a gender theist as far as I can tell, but his class analysis or yeah, some of his class analysis is pretty good and pretty spot on. And in particular, I think his analysis of the Australian union, union movement is, uh, is brilliant. So to give an example from the Australian union movement, all the unions in Australia are approved or like overseen by the Australian Council of Trade Unions, the ACTU which is like the big governing body of all the unions. For decades, there has been a sort of a union called the SDA, called the Shop something, Shop Shoppies is their thing. Uh, and the, they're not even, they're barely a union. They're, from what I understand, dominated by the right wing of the Labour Party, so our Democrats, and they're like super homophobic, um, all this kind of crazy stuff. And they've essentially been in cahoots with the bosses for decades, exploiting their workforce. And they've been able to do this because the workforce that they represent are retail workers. And so they're the workers that are like the youngest and most casual, et cetera, et cetera. So they're the people who aren't going to notice when their union, union is not doing what a union's supposed to do, because this is often the first interaction anyone or any of them have had with a union. And the thing about it is um, this has been, had been evident for decades and decades and the number of union members has plummeted. And it's not like specifically as a result of that policy, there are larger socioeconomic reasons for the drop, but it certainly didn't fucking help that for decades and decades, the only union, that was one of the rules, because the ACTU had this thing called demarcation, which meant that um, you couldn't have two unions going over the, uh, two unions representing the same workforce, because that meant unions would compete with each other. And apparently that was a bad thing. Um, you know, it had it, been, been bad in the past. And so they like would constantly bleed about demarcation, demarcation. It stops the fighting, blah, blah, blah. Even though <laughs> there are so many more like destructive pieces of legislation or policies or things that have happened to the union movement that were so much more pressing than demarcation, such as the accord, but you only ever heard about demarcation, demarcation. That's why we can't do anything about the SDA. And the reason why this was an issue is because there were things being done uh, for retail workers in New Zealand. And the reason why they were able to be done was because the New Zealand union movement had suffered such a catastrophic attack that it essentially like wiped out large sections of it, from what I understand. And that sort of meant like there just weren't there wasn't anyone else trying to get those workers. So it meant a new union could start up from scratch and they were called Unite and they had a lot of success around essentially the like $15 an hour, like that same type of demand, um, but in New Zealand. Uh, so people were watching this from Australia going like, why can't we do this? And the ACTU was, yeah, it's just like, well, you know, we've got to follow the rules. And just recently, maybe in the last five years, evidently whatever old decrepit fuckwit <laughs> that was maintaining the SDA's monopoly on the first workers like the like you know workers as soon as they enter the workforce uh died hopefully and now there is a second union called the retail and fast food workers union and it's a lot more democratic, a lot more grassroots. There's no crazy old Christians in it as from as far as I'm aware. <laughs> uh, but most importantly, it's a good proper grassroots union. So I have another proposal that is much more, I don't know, outside the box, but I don't want to suggest that I think, you know, that's the only way we can do things and that, um, 
the more kind of traditional stuff that people are doing isn't going to lead anywhere because I, I think that there's the it, it does so yeah I think new experimental forms of unions I think also um unions around new industries like uber and that type of thing which are difficult I haven't really given that a lot of thought but in terms of what's something that could that might spark something that shifts balance of forces um yeah some type of new way of unionizing the gig economy I could see definitely doing that so yeah those are the more um those are the more mainstream kind of suggestions the problem with traditional unionism and this has been a big thing like that boots talks about the thing that undercuts the power of the unions is not being able to do solidarity strikes um having workers in different industries striking in solidarity with each other they want to keep it you know they want to make it as small as possible ideally they want you to have no connection to any other worker if they're forced to allow you to have a connection to any other worker they just want it to be the other workers at your workplace if they're forced to allow you to have a broader connection they just want it to be with other workers in your industry they always want to try and keep it not the working class they want to make it an individual dispute between a specific worker and a specific boss what we want to do is we want to make it the working class we want to make it everybody in this class versus them now that's very difficult to do obviously so i'm going to put forward a framework for how this type of thing could be done and it's sort of it's using a mishmash of lots of different ideas but essentially it's about the idea of civil resistance as opposed to civil disobedience uh people who tell you that there is no difference between civil resistance and civil disobedience are fucking idiots <laughs> they don't know what they're talking about civil disobedience is performance art you break a specific law in a media friendly way so that when your photograph is taken it shows the world this kind of morality play that's basically what civil disobedience is civil resistance is materially disrupting the functioning of society with a political aim. So, <clears throat> one of the things that I guess we're trying to do is anything that we want, really, we don't have because the billionaire class doesn't want us to have it. So, for example, the refugee rights movement in Australia spends a lot of time trying to educate ordinary Australians, like white Australians, about refugees in order to uh minimize their prejudices. The problem with this <laughs> is that our mandatory detention of refugees, which is where Trump got his baby jails idea from, started in the early 90s. and it was introduced by the labor party so our version of the democrats um under the assumption that it would be a temporary that it would be a temporary measure which they would soon undo and then obviously they lost power to the conservatives and the conservatives kept it going and labor sort of says well you know we couldn't do anything we weren't in power and it's like yeah but you fucking set that up knowing that that was what was going to happen or you're so fucking incompetent <laughs> that you shouldn't be doing what you're doing one of those two things it had nothing to do with the prejudices like <laughs> that's the thing is that like they have to tell us what our prejudices are when they need them to be our prejudices we didn't need to hate arabs until there was like a a socio-political reason for that to be the case otherwise you're just like an ignorant white person and you're like i don't know where the fuck that is like you don't you know it's like nobody in australia has a passionate hatred of like inuits because there's no <laughs> like we could <laughs> i'm sure many of us would want to but like 
there's no material reason for that to be the case. So it's not going to really stick. So making the focus educating the dumb bogans about not being racist is perfect for bourgeois liberals because it means they don't have to actually challenge power and they can just constantly wring their hands going like, oh, the bogans are still bogans. What are we going to do? Actually like tackle the people with the power. And yeah, that's what's kind of stupid about this oversimplistic privilege dialogue because privilege can be a weapon. A mortal technique had this line where he was like, a gangster isn't someone who takes your money. A gangster is someone who makes you take his. That, you know, also reminds me of the Stanford prison experiment, how just even those kids like, you know, given a jail for however many days worked out, oh, if we give privileges to um, certain ones just to fuck with people's heads, um, it breaks down solidarity. And so there are certain groups getting certain privileges, but just because they're getting privileges doesn't mean they're getting those privileges because they want them. So, for example, politicians, you'll constantly hear people saying, you know, oh, the politician got 100,000 and spent 20,000 on this. Meanwhile, <laughs> like actual capitalists are taking off with trillions of dollars and they're like, oh, look at the fish he bought. So the perks that a politician gets, they and we're like, oh, it's because they're greedy and they have the power. It's because they don't have the power. <laughs> That's why they have those perks. What, the reason why they have those perks is because the billionaire class needs to make sure that the uh, political class has enough privilege that they can be sent plummeting into an unrecognizable hellscape if they should ever disobey the orders of the billionaires. And that's pretty much going to be the case until after the problem is solved. A lot of liberals have this idea that, yeah, we'll just come up with a really relatable, really articulate, like whatever the fucking good element is, something that will just like one day wake everybody up and then they'll go to the polls the following election and elect a party that does what they want. Just so delusional, but also historically not really accurate at all. And if you look at, uh, read Martin Luther King's letter to Birmingham jail, yeah, he says this exact thing. And he talked a lot about how white liberals were the worst fucking people. And they're often the bigger impediment than the conservatives. If you look at the civil rights struggle, everybody hated the civil rights struggle until long after it had succeeded. So somehow, without majority support, it succeeded in forcing material changes. And then once the material changes were made, the ideological changes just came as a result of that. Yeah, so we need to figure out a way that a small group of people, or we need to figure out a way that a group of people that is not the majority can force a material chain against the will of the majority to such a degree that it fundamentally changes class relations such that culture and the superstructure also changes. And that sounds grand and complicated, but it's actually, once you have a clear idea of what you're trying to do, figuring out how to do it on a practical level is pretty easy. That's kind of the, the, the sit down strike thing. Like sitting down isn't complicated. <laughs> it's the coordinating and the political con consciousness required to coordinate sitting down, which is complicated. So I've been talking for half an hour. I think I'm going to watch that and then, um, maybe make another half.